Good afternoon uh, from Shanghai. I'm pleased to welcome you to our webinar today, Wins and Losses uh, in the EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment. Um, last December, the European Union in China reached an agreement on the conclusion of the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, the CAI, or uh, CAI, as we call it. The EU's first ever standalone bilateral investment treaty. On Friday, the 22nd of January, uh, the main text of uh, the treaty was published. The agreement aims to address the existing asymmetries in terms of market access and level playing field between European companies investing and operating in China and Chinese businesses doing the same in the European Union, as well as to promote sustainable development initiatives by highlighting core environmental standards and lab, uh, labor rights. We are pleased today to welcome um, experts to discuss these, the issues around the comprehensive agreement on investment. We read many different views, so we are very pleased today to um, welcome um, different speakers with different views to discuss later on a panel. But we'll be starting with an introduction by Mr. Carlo D'Andrea, who is Vice President of the European Chamber here in, based here in Shanghai and Chairman of the Shanghai Board. He will be followed by uh, Maria Martin Pratt, the uh, Chief Negotiator for the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment. She joined us very last minute and we're really honored to, to have you here, Maria. We met you many times also in Shanghai and Beijing over the last seven years, and uh, we are very honored to, to um, have you tell us more about uh, the agreement. The uh, panel discussion will follow uh, the two speeches and we'll have our president from Beijing, Jörg Wutke, as well as Alicia Garcia Herrero, who's a chief economist for Asia Pacific, uh, Pacific Atlantics. I think Alicia is in Taiwan right now, but I'm not, not quite sure. As well as uh, Francois Godemont, who is senior advisor for Asia at the Institut Montaigne, non-resident non senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and external consultant for the policy planning staff of the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now, Carlo will be starting with a few opening words to set the scene. Thank you, Johanna, and uh, thank you all uh, the panelists and uh, also our secretary and put together this uh, uh, webinar. This is the week of the Chinese New Year, but uh, here we have over 100 plus attendees uh, to this uh, webinar, which uh, is a real sign how is important for the European and uh, Chinese uh, business community in, uh, to discuss about this important agreement. The signing of the comprehensive agreement on investment is a landmark step in improving the economic relationship between the EU and China. In a time of continued uncertainty, tangible progress like this can go a long way in making European businesses and investors more confident in the Chinese market. The CAI, in the European way, will focus on market access and level playing field, two of the main issues plaguing European companies in China. When surveyed in 2020, 40% of uh, uh, business confidence survey respondents perceived that the foreign investment enterprise are treated unfavorably compared to domestic Chinese company. Although this is the lowest figures in many years, any improvement is offset by the fact that 29% reported they do not expect foreign enterprises to, end, to ever have a level playing field in their industry. So how can company feel stable operating in such condition? It is therefore reassuring that the CAI will prioritize a level playing field with proposed measures, including regulation of the behavior of state-owned enterprises and enacting transparencies for subsidies. 
Besides unfair competition with local companies, market access barrier uh, have also precluded many European companies from reaching their full potential here in China by causing many to lose out on business opportunity. More than half of uh, 2020 business confidence survey respondents believe that Chinese companies in their sector enjoy better market access in Europe than vice versa. And this will be one of the main points of discussion, I guess, later on in our panel. The CAI will aim to address this imbalance by binding and by reaching existing Chinese commitment and in a target strategic sector like automotive, healthcare, and ICT, it achieves additional market access commitment from China. The benefit of binding and ratcheting commitment are that they provide legal certainty, as well as a channel to address non-compliance under the mechanism established in the CAI. CAI will also impose a prohibition on the forced transfer of technology. Although this issue of uh, technology transfer has uh, certainly improved in the past years, and not only because of the foreign investment law, of course, in sectors like medical uh, device, aerospace, and aviation and environment, the crown jewel of European innovation, nearly a third of BCS respondent report having been compelled to transfer technology in order to maintain market access. It's important to note, however, that beside direct market access barrier, indirect barrier like discrimination and opaque inefficient process in licensing still pose an obstacle for nearly a third of uh, business confidence survey respondent. The CAI addresses this true requirement for impartiality in licensing granting, including for limited licenses and transparency in process, including clear requirement and reasonable processing, timelines and channel. Climate change, indeed, is the crisis of our lifetime and must be addressed by multilateral cooperation and planning. The CAI reflects in both its market access commitment, in particular for environmental services and in the section on sustainable development that shared willingness from the EU and China to promote green investment that contributes to achieving their respective goals in the environment and climate policy. Indeed, many say that the provision on uh, forced labor are too weak. This will be another sensitive point to discuss today. Under the agreement, China commits to make sustained effort to ratify a relevant international labor organization convention on labor. Although many say that this promise is not enough, this commitment is unprecedented from the Chinese side. As European businessmen in China, I just passed my 15 years anniversary last few months ago, I've been eager to see a conclusion of this agreement that has been years in the making. Uh, Johanna was mentioned that we met in Shanghai and Beijing, but of course also many times in Brussels, we were knocking on the door on uh, Maria and our uh, team in order to get update and give us our feedback. Of course, no compromise can be perfect. And there have been criticism Levi against the CAI. While the CAI will certainly not address all the concern of European companies, it will be complemented by a host of other instruments, such as the foreign direct investment screening mechanism, the white paper on uh, foreign subsidies, and glo global human rights sanction regime. We understand that many of us do not share this uh, positive view. And therefore, I look forward to hearing 
which one will be the analysis of our panelists today in order to have an objective view of this important step between the relationship on the AU and China. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlo. Uh, Maria, the floor is yours. You have to unmute, yes. I just unmute myself. Uh, can you hear me, right? Yes, very well. Okay, well, let me start by thanking you, CCC, for, for this occasion. Uh, it is indeed the case that we have had very uh, close and continuous contact uh, over the years, uh, as clearly uh, what we have been trying to do with the CHI is first and foremost to facilitate the life of our businesses, our investors in China. And I think it is important to start by, by this point. Um, Thai needs to be assessed on the basis of what it is. And it is a targeted tool. It is not a tool to uh, turn China into a market economy. It is not a tool that will bring about a solution for a number of foreign policy problems. It is a specific tool to be considered together with other ones uh, in our attempts to improve uh, a reality, which is the importance of the Chinese um, market for our businesses, their presence in that market and the problems that you face when trying to operate in, in China. Uh, there are a number of elements in the agreement that aim at addressing those problems. I'm not gonna go through all of them. They've just been a sketch in the, in the prior presentation. But let me highlight a couple of them. First of all, uh, in terms of market access, uh, one first thing that it is important to keep in mind is that uh, with Kai, we will be locking in, uh, binding and ratcheting the 20 years of liberalization that China has undertaken since its entry in the WTO in 2001. This is one of the problems uh, that often comes up in the discussion, and it is absolutely true. Uh, the commitments that the EU has vis-a-vis -vis China in terms of market opening, in particular in the services sector that is covered by the WTO, are far greater than those China has vis-a-vis -vis the EU, vis-a-vis -vis the EU and vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Uh, clearly, uh, the market openings that were negotiated at the time of the WTO accession uh, were limited in the area of services, far more concentrated in the area of industrial goods. And, and the economy of China has changed tremendously in the last 20 years. But the reality is that whether you take financial services, telecommunication services, or others, we are far more committed to China than China is to us. And that is something that Kai will uh, including them on top of that, uh, new commitments that China hadn't bind vis-a-vis uh, -vis us before in the area of manufacturing, very important, more than half of our FDI screening in, in, in the country. And as it was already indicated, uh, further new commitments in some key strategic areas of interest for European investors. Besides the market opening, what we have tried as well has been in a very targeted manner to have rules that should help improving the situation of our companies on the market. Uh, forced technology transfer is an issue that has been hotly debated in the past and where I think now you have a catalog of obligations in the CHI that match those that were included in the phase one agreement of the United States and on some points go beyond them. Um, we do have also, and this is the first time that China has agreed uh, to such rules in a bilateral original treaty, we do have also obligations related to state-owned enterprises. Again, we're not going to change the weight of SOEs in the Chinese economy. We are not going to do away with the presence of SOEs, but we are trying at least to have disciplines that will help in terms of 
addressing discriminatory behaviors of SOEs, and ensuring transparency in that uh, behavior, including the possibility for the European Union to challenge China, raise problems and request information when we see SOEs acting in a manner that is to the detriment of our businesses. Um, on the same line, we do have as well transparency related provisions for subsidies, including subsidies in the area of services, something that we had not uh, covered in the past in the WTO and including an on-demand specific request from transparency mechanism. Again, something that we believe we can use directly to discuss with China when we are in the presence of uh, subsidy schemes, uh, support in one or another way, uh, whether China wants to recognize it as a subsidy or not, uh, that we believe uh, hurts our investors in the uh, Chinese market. There are a number of other things, some of them that we have discussed with the EU CCC uh, quite regularly, such as, for instance, the access to standard setting bodies, the issue of uh, technological neutrality as regards the provision of telecommunication services with a uh, uh, high valid uh, added value, or um, matters related to fairness and transparency in antitrust. Now, of all this uh, group of rules, what I also think is very important to keep in mind is that they are enforceable. Uh, we do have a state-to-state -state dispute resolution. The commission has clearly indicated, and this is not only in relation to CHI, but more generally since the beginning of this commission, that our priority now increasingly turns towards the enforcement of commitments that have been taken by our trading partners, either in the WTO context or in our bilateral agreements, we are putting a lot of resources to ensure that our agreements get enforced. We will, will, we will do that as well in the context of CHI uh, after its ratification. Um, we also uh, think, and with this I will finish, mm, that CHI is, CHI is part of a larger uh, strategy. So in that respect, uh, when I say it is a targeted tool, it is important to understand it. It comes together with our uh, willingness to uh, coordinate and work with other allies, uh, the US, but also Japan, Canada, Australia, and many others. I think that kind of multi-pronged approach with China, which is in part engagement and in part coordination with others is something you will recognize in the policies vis-a-vis -vis China of many of our trading partners. And it is, uh, as you all know, the case that other important trading partners have concluded agreements with China recently uh, or are in the process of reviewing and updating their existing agreements with China. And the last point that I think it is important uh, to highlight is that we've been extremely careful when negotiating CHI to ensure it does not affect the work we have been doing in parallel and that we continue to do to first protect our security, second, protect the integrity of the European internal market, and third, protect our values. Uh, so you have work there related to FDA screening, export control, 5Gs, that is very, very important for us to maintain and to develop further. You have work ongoing as regards the effect of subsidies in the European internal market, where we are also working uh, very, very uh, effectively, I hope, uh, and be able to put a proposal on the table uh, of the Commission in the coming months. And the same goes as regards the respect of our values, more specifically uh, to complement commitments related to forced labor and to make sure we have the instruments we need to defend human rights. I'll stop there and I'm happy to get into any details in the follow up discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, uh, Maria, to, to give us uh, uh, this insight. Uh, I open the panel also to our uh, uh, colleagues, but I would like one second to follow up with you. Uh, what are the most controversial, controversial part of the agreement in your personal opinion? When you were uh, there? 
that one you had to discuss the most uh, in order to get what do you want, what the European community wanted. <laughs> if, if you mean, um, if you mean the issues that was, uh, those issues that we had to negotiate the longest and until the last minute related to market access, I think it's also very important to keep in mind that Europe has been quite careful in terms of the bindings that it has taken vis-a-vis -vis China, basically because uh, our objective was to rebalance the respective market access openings. Uh, and therefore, we clearly indicated to China that we were not going to move very far from our current commitments in the context of the WTO. So um, we had to negotiate until the very end in order to get further commitments in a number of sectors. And the second aspect that uh, it was very clearly difficult to, to negotiate related to commitments in the area of labor sustainable development and labor. Uh, those related to climate and environment had been concluded earlier in the negotiations, but those related to labor for very obvious reasons uh, were the last part of, of, of the discussions to be concluded. Thank you, thank you. Indeed, indeed, important point that uh, all the international uh, media outlet uh, uh, touch upon. Uh, Jorg, uh, I would like to to listen uh, your point of view. During the past years, we push a lot in order to have uh, this comprehensive agreement of investment uh, negotiate. And uh, in the end, Europe, the EU and China, they kept the promise to conclude before the end of the 2020. Well, first of all, it's wonderful to sit here in the, uh, with uh, family members, so to speak. I mean, we all know each other for decades nearly uh, and, and discuss a very uh, important matter. Uh, now, if I, if I just speak on behalf of the chamber and resonate with the members, I can tell you that actually the major chunk of our membership actually really appreciates that this is signed, sealed and not yet delivered, but you know, we hope. Uh, uh, but the German uh, chamber came up with a survey last week, which was very interesting, uh, because there are very high expectations towards this uh, uh, CHI, I might call it. 40% uh, said that they expect better market access, and 39% better level playing field. Now, for some of them, that sounds more like a minority for all of us actually being on the ground, pushing the envelope every day. And you know, our position paper, 400 pages doing this since more, more or less since 20 years. We know it is very, very difficult to make China to change something which is not in their own interest. So in a way, I really appreciate what Maria and her team has done is define the areas where our interests overlap with the interest uh, of, of uh, China. Now, the CHI is certainly not a wonder work. It is something in realistic terms uh, that I would say helps us. And I'm very happy that actually it was concluded in December last year. Seven years is more than enough. And I've been doing a couple of billion dollars projects in China. I can tell you the longer you negotiate, the worse it sometimes gets. And I remind you of 99 when WTO was around the corner, Jun Ji was in the White House and offering a deal to President Clinton. President Clinton turned it down, Jun Ji left for Vancouver or Ottawa is next point, and the Americans realized it was a mistake, we were trying to catch him, and he says, no, I cannot. And then two years later, the WTO deal was signed between the US and uh, uh, China, and it was much worse uh, than it was in 99. So sometimes you just have to get off the table and say, this is it. And I'm very happy that there was a deadline that actually was sort of anticipated by the uh, German Chancellor as well as Juncker as well as others uh, in uh, 2019 for the simple reason is that at that time the Chinese had zero interest in Europe, zero. 
Uh, they skipped meetings. Leocha didn't come to Brussels. And we felt very much like, okay, so what's the purpose of having an investment agreement discussions if those guys don't even show up? And so there was this kind of artificial deadline uh, imposed by saying, you know, we do this until the end of 2020, and then this is it. And in a way, I'm very grateful, but you gain leverage out of this. And I always said to these uh, leaders in Europe, as well as in Berlin, that you always have to have the ability of getting off the table and walk back and walk home. So in a way, I'm always trying to challenge those that say you could have negotiated longer and you've gotten a better deal. My experience is sometimes if you overextend this, you end up with a much worse, uh, worse deal. The United States has always been basically uh, leaning on us and saying, you know, why don't you wait for the Biden administration and so forth. And I was always saying the last week of December, I wait for what? Uh, give me the structure. Is it going to be phase two? Is it us together? Uh, what's the timeline? What's your purpose and all of this? This is going to take two or three years in order to team up together and sit down with the Chinese beside the fact the Chinese would never allow this in the first place. So the way this whole notion about we should wait for the United States was frankly to me ridiculous because I could not see any sense that we get a better deal. Besides the fact, how would that be perception in Europe? A new administration comes into town and we have to wait for their blessing in order to sit down to do a bilateral deal that we have been discussing for seven years. I found this really uh, strange and I told my American friends as well as I will tell them tonight as I'm on the US Chamber uh, event that this was a no-go. I'm very happy that you know Brussels decided uh, to, to go ahead on this one. This deal is much better than RCEP. Uh, that is a more sort of an amalgam of existing bilateral uh, agreements uh, with some new features such as Japan and China, but it has far more depth and far more uh, content than that, uh, let alone phase one, uh, which actually also uh, was take, took place without the blessing of Europe. Um, and uh, has a managed trade in there, uh, US telling China what to buy. Luckily, none of this is in our agreement. So ours is, is, is a deal that certainly could have been better, but this is as good as it gets, I think. Um, now, uh, to, to uh, counter a couple of parts, the kind of pessimism, can you trust the Chinese? Uh, can you assume that they will follow through? Uh, well, uh, we definitely in the chamber are realistic enough to come up with 400 pages every year in order to outline the gap of promises and delivery. But there's always this kind of thing that actually we can discuss it and follow up and do change things. Few things, too few, but we can do uh, change things. So when I asked my American friends on phase one, besides the managed trade, um, uh, about a forced uh, technology transfer, the kind of consultation, uh, I was very surprised to hear from virtually everyone that actually China has been very straightforward and, and engaging in these points. Um, and uh, that already gives me some confidence that this uh, sign, this deal that uh, Kai, that Maria negotiated will not just be a piece of paper and that China can cheat us left and right. I'm actually having confidence that China takes it serious. They should better take it serious. And I hope this uh, will be done. Final point, and I will not go into details on what it does in particular areas. Um, uh, the chamber will come up with a paper on this one, what it does to automotive financials and so forth. There are always small rooms for improvement. And that's actually what we appreciate. We didn't expect a revolution in market opening, let alone that China changes the state on driven uh, system for us. But um, uh, it is, I guess, uh, very important to realize that what Maria said in the very beginning, uh, it is one piece out of the toolbox that we engage China with. Uh, we viewed China, we Europeans in April last year, uh, actually now two years nearly, um, as a partner, a competitor, as a rival. And basically that leaves us with a toolbox where we bilaterally engage with, where they put the name under it, where we can sort of uh, take them to court, worst case, should not be the case. But uh, at the same time also it leaves us with a lot of uh, uh, opportunities to unilateral deal with China afterwards. And unilateral, of course, means including the United States that we find common ground because we have so much in common. Just looking at the position paper from the uh, MCHAM, uh, it has very 
few, uh, similar points that, that, that we do have. So in short, um, it, is, it is not revolutionary. It's not the big step or big leap forward, I would say, coming out of this country. It is definitely an improvement and our business likes it. And I'm very, very grateful for this step. Thank you. Thank you, Jorg. And thank you also as a member of the European Chamber to be so vocal on it. I remember also last year when we were in Brussels with the uh, Chinese ambassador, Jan Ming, in Brussels, say, which one is the commitment? Let's complete, let's keep the promise. And uh, now let's see how it will go. Indeed, this is the second agreement in two years that China and the EU, they could reach uh, uh, some common ground. But I would like also to hear uh, Alicia and uh, Francois' opinion. Uh, what are the most controversial part uh, of uh, this agreement in your uh, personal opinion? Please, uh, Alicia, you first. Um, well, first of all, thanks very much for the invitation. I hope you can hear me well. If that's the case, I'll go on. So, uh, Maria, we have had long discussions and I'm sure everything I'm going to say will sound repetitive to you, but I'm afraid it might not be for the rest of the audience. So I'll go ahead and you bear with me. Um, first of all, I guess this is not only about the controversial issues that I would like to judge, because I, I think that the, in full honesty, I should start by saying that there's no such thing as a good or a bad deal. It all depends on first your expectations and second the actual outcome. And it's hard to measure everybody's expectations to start second. We don't know about the final outcome. So in that regard, I think it's, it's, it's just uh, useless to in a way judge um, in that from, from this perspective, the, the guy from this perspective. But having said that, I, I, I would start by raising a few general issues. I think that the, and Maria uh, pointed out very rightly, the, the CAI in a way has very generally, uh, beyond the issue that it deals with market access and level playing field rightly so, because that was the kind of the two pillars of, of that rebalancing in favor of the EU. I think CAI in a way, and this is because of you know, how we still believe in multilateralism in Europe, leaves the final work in WTO. And let me explain uh, what I mean. So both in subsidies and uh, SOEs, um, the deal, uh, and, and that is in itself quite an achievement because I'm sure it's hard to get that from the Chinese, manages to get all the way to transparency. I, uh, you know, I need to know, um, I need to receive information on subsidies. I need to receive information on the behavior on the behavior of SOEs to to judge whether it is done on a commercial basis, which is the key concept uh, enshrined actually in this deal. And I think this is very good in itself because, in a way, it it already somehow defines what SOEs should be doing, which is very different from we have from what we had before. But that's where it stops, if I may say. So so say that once you receive this information, you think that uh, indeed those subsidies harm a European company. Then I guess, you know, that's where the, and again, I'm not saying this is not, not good. It's just that it doesn't go all the way to giving that company a tool to go further. Uh, well, it does, but we, we go, we need to go back to WTO. So in a way it facilitates uh, the provision of information needed to go to the WTO, but it doesn't kind of offer a different venue. Now, that thing is important depending on our expectations on, on the functioning first of the WTO or a potential reform of the WTO. So in a way, the, 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 the use of that uh, success, i.e. allowing for that information to be passed on to European negotiators or not negotiators, but the European Commission at that point is welcome all the more so if the WTO works, if you see what I mean. So I think this is quite important uh, to realize. The other thing is that, um, you know, on, on dispute settlement, and again, it's, it's, it's like it's somehow the same thing is, the, we, we have 
of course, decided, and maybe rightly so, because this is something that the EU doesn't uh, push anymore, not to go for an investor to state dispute settlement. And again, we didn't like this for other deals, so why push it here? Um, but the thing is, we need to wait for two years to kind of clarify whether we we'll go all the way to an international uh, investment court, whether China will agree to that. Um, and temporarily will be, if I may use that word, stuck with bilateral agreements whose coverage is very different across countries. So my question is, is this easy? I, I'm not here to ask questions, but I'm afraid I have more questions than answers on this one. Is, is, it, is it easy, both the transition, i.e. to deal with these two separate kind of regimes, yeah, bilateral on the, uh, on the dispute settlement side and the EU level for market access, for everything else, for subsidies, for transfer, is it easy to do that? And secondly, what are the chances that in two years we have something else? Because if it's only a transition, maybe I would argue, well, it's going to kind of coincide with the ratification, it's not a big deal. So I have this, this concern. Um, perhaps I would end up by saying that the world, I'm afraid, keeps on moving. And we had the UK uh, applying for CPTPP uh we have of course the u.s administration and not only the u.s administration but actually the industry making very strong calls on trade uh, or sometimes specifically on tech we have this interesting report that i'm sure you've seen on on the um, um, on i think it's the ex-ceo uh, ceo of, of google calling for the bifurcation on tech and and the idea of this asymmetry between what China can do on the one hand and what the US can respond to at the core of that uh, kind of, of, of that call. On, on UK, as I was saying, it's more like not China, but the rest of Asia. So there are other behaviors, if I may say, out there that, that might not fully represent their governments or, you know, well, in the case of the UK, yes, but I, I mean, Maybe that's just one step, and they're thinking that maybe China will enter CPTPP. I'm not saying that it's fully clear that their option is, is bifurcation or kind of moving away, or, or maybe I would say diversifying away from China. But at least it sounds as if that is a clear, uh, more of the way they're going than the way we're going. So the question is, because they're moving, the world is moving, put it this way, left, and we're moving right, no, maybe not full, as Maria said, we still keep all of those instruments, blah, blah, blah. Are we in the right spot? Are we in the right spot? That's my question. And I guess this is a dynamic question, meaning uh, is it just because, yes, the US is our largest trading partner, but in a few years it won't be. And investment is just a door for the EU to negotiate. I know that the commission will always say, no, that's not our intention a free trade agreement with China. But if it isn't, if it isn't, so if, if this is all, then I'm wondering, are we kind of, I mean, not fully rebalancing or just halfway re rebalancing? What's the cost of doing that if others are moving in a different direction? So this is kind of a more uh, geostrategic question I have, but I think it's important because other parts of the puzzle are moving. And I Thank think we realize that. I leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this definitely, are we in the right path? This is definitely uh, a good question. Francois, tell me, which one are uh, your takes on this uh, agreement? Thank, Thank you, you very much. And Thank after you very that, much. we will open the floor to the question of our uh, members because we are receiving uh, constantly new questions. So we will make another round of questions to all of you. Please, Francois. Sure. And it's not easy for us uh, to have a dialogue uh, in front of Maria Martin Pratt, who is, after all, a very competent and also modest negotiator, certainly not part of the hype that has been going on sometimes around the, uh, the agreement. Uh, yet, because the debate is structured as a debate, it is going to be the critical points that I'm going to emphasize. You know, in Greek mythology, there was a guy named Procus. Uh, who tied people he kidnapped on his bed and uh, anything that uh, didn't fit on the bed, he would just cut off. Uh, 
if I joke about DG trade and the EU, I would say that's what it's been doing with uh, trade and investment agreements with Japan, Vietnam, Korea, China. The problem is that China is a very big animal that you don't tie very easily on the same bed as Japan, for example, or even Korea. Uh, so when one looks at all those texts, they are incredibly similar in structure and language. And we could marvel all day at the language that uh, the EU has managed to get from China. Page one of the agreement, China commits to the fight against forced labor in, 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 in just as many words. It commits also, by the way, to the fight against climate change. This is the year when he has built more coal thermal plants than anybody else in the world just by itself. And let's not even talk about the reality of forced labor or other realities uh, 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 that are currently happening uh, in China. So you have to admit that a lot of the agreement and a lot of the steps forward are language. And they recall other language. We have been talking about state enterprises and subsidies. The commitment on these already came uh, within the uh, accession protocol of China to the WTO in, w in 2001. That doesn't mean that they mm -hmm. haven't been changed, yeah. doesn't mean that there can be uh, progress. Uh, but I, I would really uh, first say that we have a habit of commitments and general language from China. And as we know, and I think the people of the EUCCC know better than anybody else, the real problem is how to translate these words into realities and how to prevent other uh, decisions, uh, maybe be so-called behind the customs or other uh, types of regulations to negate uh, part of the uh, agreement. If I take an example just from the last week, uh, we know that the, uh, the CHI uh, is opening up the road for financial services and banks in a way that indeed is very similar to what the uh, US was able to sign uh, in January uh, of last year. Just last week, a new rule uh, limiting severely the ability of banks to lend in China uh, from uh, funds acquired abroad is going to discriminate very clearly against foreign banks which own only 2% uh, of the market, but whose main resource to make a profit is to use the, to leverage the difference of interest uh, between international rates and Chinese rates. That's just, the regulation may have its own justification, by the way, because of, because of the bubble economy, except that of course the foreign banks uh, only make 2% of the business in China, so they're not really the biggest actors in the bubble. Yet this is happening, this, this is kind of typical uh, of the kind of things that constantly happens. And so, like every one of the speakers, including Maria Martin Pratt, by the way, I put the accent, of course, on enforcement and dispute resolution. So very quickly, and again, with apologies for coming back uh, on a text, which uh, at least one person around this table knows much better than we do uh, in detail and how it got there, uh, on enforcement, it's clear that we can literally put aside everything that comes under sustainable development, uh, and that includes climate change, and that includes labor norms and, and, and the such, and that includes corporate social responsibility. Why? Because the, uh, literally the enforcement mechanism is voluntary uh, by bilateral uh, arbitration, but without compelling force. Uh, the only language I found with surprise uh, in the text of the agreement is that when the uh, top meeting once a year, so-called high-level economic dialogue with VPM and, uh, and, and, and vice president of the commission uh, meet, uh, what arbitration, what decision they would make would be binding. Binding, yes, but it's a political product between two uh, 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 statesmen. Uh, it has no legal it is very different from a legal process. On the other uh, aspects, first of all, as we know, uh, investment in manufacturing is not really uh, covered. Uh, it's services uh, that matters. And I know that services are the way of the future, but for the present, uh, many foreign enterprises are still in China for manufacturing and uh, 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 hope uh, to remain there. Uh, second, yes. Uh, 
the EU essentially got a, w, a WTO type uh, dispute settlement and enforcement mechanism of its own. It's literally replicating bilaterally uh, what it could get by going to WTO and people will be quick to mention that it can still go to WTO. But the only case where I think this is hugely useful is if the WTO arbitration process uh, stalls completely. And we knew under the previous American administration mm -hmm. there was something coming, uh, but it's not happening now. So hey. what's the, 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 the point? Third, and I will confine myself to that uh, last uh, remark, we don't know what the actual opening will be since the list of published sectors is not there. Uh, there are many questions there. My preliminary take from what we know is that the opening is very, very limited uh, to some uh, sectors. Uh, in, for example, there's a question in the chat box about the automotive industry. We don't really know. It's not really clear from the text uh, and it could be small, much smaller or limited than what people think. Uh, it's not at all uh, clear uh, also uh, what are the concessions to China in some areas. We have been hearing about distribution of energy, for example, in Europe. Uh, and I note that uh, uh, Chinese state firms have a legal dispute with Greece right now on exactly that topic on grids, in fact, not retail distribution. So there, there is something that is still uh, not known. Finally, about coordination with the US. It is so blatantly clear, George, that China finally moved in the power vacuum between the Trump and Biden administration, that it is a bit embarrassing uh, to admit that after waiting for seven years, uh, Europe just jumped through the hoop uh, in that small window. Uh, yes, it was at the end of a delay that the EU itself has had set uh, for the talks. Uh, but it is a bit embarrassing. And I don't think, I would never go as far as to say that the agreement has hurt in itself U.S. interests. The phase one trade deal did hurt European interests uh, in some aspects, uh, which were, in my view, not WTO compliant uh, for, and, 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 and by directly challenging uh, some EU agreements, particularly the one on geographical indications of origin. Uh, that agreement doesn't hurt the U.S., but it probably lowers the bar for expectation of what the U.S. joined by us can obtain later because the tradition of, the, of China in those negotiating phases is that once it has got something, it's, people usually say this is the beginning of a process where it will move later and concede more. I've always seen since entry into WTO that this is the ceiling, not the floor. Uh, and so it is a, a cloud, I would say, on what we might achieve later under coordination. I'll stop there, we could clearly Thank you. Mean, um, Thank, so you. Thank you, Francois. A lot of meat uh, on fire you put. Thank you to also add some uh, spicy over it. And uh, uh, Maria, uh, do you want uh, to answer uh, to, to Francois' comment? You know, Greece come again, not only as the old nightmare for the financial crisis in 2008, but now also as mythology, uh, chopping the trade opportunities. What do you would say about that? <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm very fond myself of, of Greek mythology, but I must say that this particular uh, image was, was not a a very pleasant one, but now going, going just for a quick reaction on some of the points uh, that uh, that Francois made and Alicia made. Uh, I think we need to make a difference between the assessment or the opinions related to the opportunity, uh, to whether Europe should or should not engage with China, whether rules work or don't work at all with China, or there is something in the middle. This, this is an assessment that different people can have different views, and I am sure as well our companies uh, have, uh, have their views and, and the reality on the ground. But I do think that it is important 
to have the debate, as Alicia was saying, on the basis of the actual outcome of the negotiated text. And then we need to be careful uh, not, not to mix certain things. Uh, if, for instance, I take uh, the commitments taken as regards state-owned enterprises, uh, they go beyond what you have in WTO to start with, because in WTO you only have the commitments taken in the protocol of accession by China. Uh, there is not a definition of SOE uh, that is all encompassing, whereas you have a very wide definition of SOE in CHI that covers not only uh, ownership based uh, companies, uh, but also those that the state can have uh, the possibility to influence their behavior. It covers them at all levels of the economy, and it has very specific obligations that can be then be subject to SSDS. Uh, and I think that is an example of where you can find a change, uh, and I could mention others. Uh, as regards, well, you do already have dispute settlement in WTO. Yes, of course, you do have dispute settlement in WTO. I'm leaving aside the fact that we do have a problem at the moment with the appeal mechanism, but only as far as the commitments taken by China and WTO are concerned. And as I was explaining at the beginning of my intervention, those in particular in the area of services are very modest. Mm -hmm. So if you on the ground have a problem with discriminations as regards, for instance, financial service of telecommunications, don't hope to have resource in the WTO on the basis of the WTO dispute settlement, simply because the commitments that China has taken in that context are very limited. You will be able to have resource to the state to state dispute resolution in CHI. But that uh, is, is, is what we have what we have done that. And, and, and another point that I think is important just to make clear, manufacturing is cover. Of course it's cover. We are perfectly aware of the fact that it's more than half of European FDA in China. And we have made sure that China takes ambitious commitment in the area of manufacturing. Again, uh, I don't want to get into, into the more details of, of, of the text, although I think it is important uh, when emitting an opinion to do it on the basis of, of, of what it is actually uh, in there. Um, I understand uh, the concerns as to what kind of effect will this have in our cooperation with, with others. But there again, I think what the European Union is doing is indeed the right strategy, which is engagement on the one hand and autonomous measures on the others. And I do think that is very similar to the strategy you will see in other countries. And it's mesmerizing uh, to hear that we are judged by different standards that all of the other countries around the world that have concluded agreements with China, as if we did not have the right to try to help the situation of our companies in China by engaging with China while keeping as well the possibility to take other measures. So in that respect, uh, again, it's a matter of an assessment as to political opportunity and others. I'm very confident that uh, Kai will not be an obstacle to our future policy in China, both in terms of unilateral autonomous measures and in terms of coordination with others. But I am also confident that if we can implement KITE, it will give us a tool that we can use to help your companies improve to some extent their situation on the ground. Without KITE, we will not have that. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Now I would like to give uh... Uh, the floor to Joanna because she collect uh, the few questions for all the others that we will may not answer today. We will uh, keep track and we will try to give you as uh, answer as soon as we can. Please, Joanna. Yes, we have received quite a few questions. The first one would be uh, from an anonymous uh, person asking why the um, why the EU uh, often stresses that uh, CHI is part of a larger strategy and toolbox, it is unclear what the status of this is. Can a comprehensive EU Indo-Pacific strategy be expected soon? What is the status, for example, of the international procurement uh, instrument? This probably goes again to Maria. Do you want me to react? Please, so straight away, or do you yeah. want to? Yeah, if you could react to this one, yeah. Uh, 
Okay, but I, I can do it very quickly. The reason why we insist on Kai being part of a broader strategy is because very clearly, and this is something that we uh, already defined back in 2019, we consider China is too complex, a geopolitical and economic reality to try to address problems on the basis of one single tool. And that is why we think that engagement is a very important part of our strategy, but at the same time is not sufficient. And it is not sufficient, as I was saying before, uh, in terms of ensuring that our security and public order does not get affected by certain behaviors of China in ensuring that there are no distortions in our internal market, again, because of the behaviors of China, and also in trying to defend values that Europe has and that are clearly not shared uh, by the Chinese regime. Um, in the first category, and in terms of tools, uh, we are already implementing the foreign direct investment screening mechanism. We have concluded the negotiations on the export control uh, regulation that enters into force now and is being reinforced. Uh, we are deploying with a number of uh, challenging uh, instances our 5G tool strategy to ensure that the deployment of 5G, uh, 5G networks does not affect the security of our member states. Uh, there is work going in the area of subsidies. Uh, we continue negotiations in the area of public procurement, although this particular instrument is been for a long time blocked by, by member states. We hope to be able now to block it. So I'm just trying to say, you don't address a reality like China on the basis of an investment agreement. We have never pretended that, and you will have never seen a policy vis-a-vis -vis China and the Commission that is based in one, on one single instrument. So that's what I mean when I say it's part of a, a broader strategy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Maria. The next question comes from Ying Ding, uh, asking about rumors that the EU China uh, Kai will have products getting approved in the EU. How do you assess the risks? Your Galicia and, and Francois short statements. Maybe, maybe as, uh, you mean the approval in the European Parliament. What are the chances? Yeah, what are the risks? Yeah, chances, basically. Also. The risks are manifold, uh, and the risks primarily lie in, in China. Uh, as Francois has already pointed out, you know, uh, uh, China's, not, China's soft power and the lure is not very high in Europe. And of course, uh, if that swings more towards the negative, then a lot of people in the European Parliament will not be uh, uh, very um, happy to vote for a deal like this, even though it benefits their own industry, creates jobs in Europe. I was last week with the Communist Party and I actually for 90 minutes talked about Xinjiang and the danger to the investment agreement. Um, so in a way, the biggest risk is that China is tightening the screws in areas such as Hong Kong, Taiwan, Xinjiang. Uh, that doesn't go down well in public opinion. Public opinion is important in the parliament. And it's so it, the upside is that it's in China's hands. Uh, in order to uh, make sure that this doesn't happen and they show commitment in order to make sure that a deal like this uh, is passing. Alicia and Francois, any comments on this? Oh. Maybe yes. My comment is almost a question. Uh, it's about the uh, investment protection chapter. This is clearly, it had to be left aside. It's left aside again in other agreements, for example, with Japan. And I know that even with Japan, uh, the conclusion is not evident. It's not evident that the investment court principle will be accepted fully uh, by Japan if my information is up to date. Uh, if we had an, an investment protection chapter, we'd probably need ratification by national parliaments, which even under normal circumstances is extremely difficult, as we all know. Uh, with China, uh, I have my doubts. So what are the chances that we live for a long time with a, 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 an investment agreement that actually leaves in place those 25 or 26 uh, old bilateral treaties? Uh, and wouldn't that be to the advantage of China, in fact, not to have to commit uh, to more? It, to me, it's, a, it's an open question. 
Alicia. Alicia. Uh, no, I just wanted to say that my impression is that the European Parliament this time around will not only talk about human rights and, you know, but actually also about what are we giving away. Uh, if you think about it, it, I mean, it sounds like it's a one way uh, deal. Yeah, I mean, it's just because we want to rebalance. Uh, thus, we will rebalance. But anybody who knows China well, and I'm sure the 100 plus people who do know very well that that's not the way things work with China and even with others. So I think they would want to know what are we giving in. And, and I think that's going to be at the core of the discussion. Uh, we we know that the, of course the appendices are not out, but there's uh, public discussions actually uh, by members of the uh, commission um, on on green uh, on a reciprocity basis. That might be very small. I have no judgment, but I'm saying after they will go into what are we doing? Uh, the right to regulate is in the Probably not, but they may want to know to what extent. Uh, so I think beyond the, you know, the usual suspects, which you just mentioned, Francois, on uh, and etc. Oh, sorry, uh, your, um, but I think there's more than that, and and that might be harder to answer. Thank you. I have a question, uh, Maria, probably uh, from Tina uh, Schoen. Um, she asked about uh, standards. Transparency and standard setting are important parts of the agreement. Would it allow equal access for companies to standard setting bodies and technical policies? Um, I can reply very quickly to that, yes. Uh, that is uh, an obligation that you find in treaty in terms of ensuring uh, equal access and non-discrimination for our companies to uh, have access to standard setting bodies in China and to the technical committees. And this is something that we had discussed with your companies for a long time, in particular as regards uh, specific uh, technical committees in areas uh, such as telecommunications. Uh, so I think that that is, uh, that is clear and you can read it in the treaty. A very quick reaction. Um, I fully agree with uh, uh, your uh, comment as to, as to the political debate. And uh, I think we are all mindful of the fact that uh, the debate in the European Parliament will not happen in a political vacuum. And that is something that is, that is very important uh, and that I respect is part of the uh, democratic debate, and I hope China understand that as well. Um, and I think that it will be the most important part of, of the debate. In terms of a debate as to what has been given to China uh, with the publication of the text, with the publications of the offers, I don't think that will be a very hard debate to have because it can be based on fact and not on, uh, you know, uh, conspiracy theories, and I have uh, quite a bit of confidence in terms of what we have negotiated and the fact that it does not affect our right to regulate. That's very, very clear. We never do that in any agreement. And, and also it does, it does remain at a level that uh, I think it's not just a matter of we wanted to rebalance. It is the objective we had and what we have achieved and the reasons for China to enter in the agreement are others. Um, one point, because I see a lot of insistence on, on investor to state dispute resolution. It seems to me here, I like to call back reality and reality is you, your business. In years discussing with you and being uh, often in China, I have not heard once uh, a member of the EU CCC asking to have the possibility to take a dispute against China on the basis of an investor to state dispute resolution. And I think this is also proven by the fact that uh, the 26 BITs that already exist between China and the, EU, and the EU have never been used by a EU investor uh, to take China to, to a dispute. I think it's far more effective for the European Union 
to take disputes on the basis of a state-to-state -state dispute resolution system. So we will continue the negotiations because we want to replace the 26 BITs from member states to update them and modernize them. But let's be clear, of the priorities uh, of the industry, the importance for us in terms of rebalancing the level playing field are in the rules that we have in the concluded negotiations. Uh, standards as regards what constitutes expropri expropriation of, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, fair and equitable treatment are a very specific type of public international law discuss pri private international law discuss in a different type of treaties and we will continue those negotiations so i think it is important not to say that the liberalization part is undermined because you don't have uh, ideas i don't think that reflects reality thank you very much uh we have a question from uh, ucb um asking for um opportunities uh, for industries, which industry do you think will benefit the most from CHI? Maria, probably you and Jörg for this question. This sub the subtitle is, uh, is the automotive sector the big winners of it? <laughs> so, which do you, which industry uh, do you Briefly, uh, we, don't, we, we don't have a big winner. We don't have a big winner. We have a couple of uh, improvements in construction. We have a couple of improvements in the healthcare sector. We have um, uh, in the in the um, uh, renewables, a uh, uh, young term uh, reciprocity with Chinese uh, aims to invest in Europe. We can now bring uh, a hard reciprocity here uh, in uh, in uh, China. Uh, in R and D, uh, there is uh, a normal binding commitment uh, in, in when it comes to uh, areas in social science and humanities and so forth. And actually, the big point that most people don't realize is first, for the first time, uh, we have we have a possibility to hold China with its feet on, at the fire, meaning that we have an SOE mechanism to get more transparency there. We have a subsidy uh, mechanism that gets more transparency there. It might also, it has to be tested and it has to be screened, but at least China put the signature, not yet, but they were able to put the signature under something which we would call transparency. And uh, that might be a baby step, but a baby step in the right direction in order to get a little bit of more level playing field here. Thank you. Maria? If I, if I may add, if, if I just may add one thing that I think is important, and this is not related to a specific uh, new uh, market openings. What you gain with Kai is that you will not be dependent on China applying the market openings uh, in their law or not, uh, or um, China deciding to maintain that level of opening or trying to go backwards. In case of problems, you can also rely on the existence of binding commitments in an international agreement that has a dispute settlement mechanism between the European Union and China. So as representatives of businesses in China, in case where there are problems that lead, for instance, to a closing of markets or a discrimination in areas that were meant not uh, to be uh, out of reach for investment in China any longer, you do have rules and enforcement, something that you didn't have before other than Chinese law and Chinese uh, courts. And I think you will agree with me that makes a difference. Um, a question to all panelists. Um, Zol Yanis is asking, how do you expect Beijing to react if the EU uses defensive tools against China uh, slash Chinese companies, procurement instruments, strict FDI screening, action against subsidies, uh, possibly even sanctions? Does the EU have to be careful with this before ratification of the CHI? Uh, maybe Jörg, Alicia and, and Francois and Maria as well. It is always a very bad thing in order to already approach a problem with fear. Uh, you know, if we actually really want to move the needle, we just have to take a risk and ask for uh, uh, things that we demand in the rightful manner. 
Uh, so I, I think really uh, we have to get away from the notion that China is going to breathe down our neck or we hold us hostages in some areas. Uh, we have to go beyond that place and actually say now we have a mechanism that forces them to be more transparent. We have a dispute settlement and I'm sure along the way it's going to be painful. Uh, but I mean, after all, I hope this deal also signed up by 27 uh, member states will actually get a little bit of more solidarity among the member states when it comes to China. Mm. Alicia and Francois, any thoughts on this? I, um, I have to say that I think it's going to be very difficult. Uh, on, san on sanctions, um, I mean, I, I don't think we, we can follow the US and to start because we didn't even before guys, why would we, I mean, I, I, but on um, what worries me the most is the, uh, the work, I think very good work the commission has done on subsidies and uh, an impact on the single market. That for me is the key, uh, the key thing to hopefully keep. And I just hope it will happen. Uh, because we need it to ensure competition in our own market. This is a different different story. I, I mean, it's natural that uh, with members of the EU CCC in China, we focus on the nitty gritty issues of investment. But the deal is about also wider issues, those precisely that are under sustainable development and climate change, which uh, you emphasized at the beginning of the meeting. Strikes me that China is already saying writing in the Global Times, but also uh, Yang Chi uh, talking to, uh, uh, communicating with Anthony Blinken, uh, that it says it will only cooperate on those issues which he has pledged to cooperate on, such as climate change, if the partner doesn't cross the red line. And the red line is criticizing, criticizing China on such a huge list of issues, which to some of you may sound political and political only, but really they concern the whole of society. Uh, from foreign policy, from Taiwan, from Hong Kong, to Xinjiang, to human rights, uh, and so on. So that what we can see, the, the ink is hardly dry uh, on, 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 on the project of, of, of the agreement regarding sustainable development and everything that falls under it. But China is already uh, making reservations uh, about under what terms would it follow through. So I am not well placed to know, to judge, whether this would also apply to what I call the nitty gritty issues where indeed there is a state to state process uh, with some binding uh, condition and some enforcement. Uh, but I just caution uh, on that. Well, I cannot uh, say uh, more at the present time. Maria, your final thoughts? I, I think, uh, it is very important, uh, and I, I agree with the prior speakers, uh, with Francois and Alicia, to be cautious. But I also agree with Jork in his assessment as to uh, the need to have uh, the strength to engage um, and to push for our interests, and in that respect, there is certainly no change in the resolution of the European Union to continue in the implementation of the tools we have and the finalization of the tools we are preparing. And that includes indeed an instrument to address the distortive effects of Chinese subsidies in the European internal market. We are not gonna compromise what we want to do there uh, because of CHI and we've been We've been very careful when drafting Kai to ensure that it cannot affect that. So again, uh, no one here is blue-eyed as to the realities and the difficulties uh, in dealing uh, with, uh, with a reality like China. And I think you will be the first ones to agree with that. That doesn't mean that we cannot do anything and that we cannot have an engagement that is constructive in terms of uh, facilitating as well uh, your life as European business, uh, generating money and creating jobs uh, in, in, in the European Union as well as in China. Thank you very much, Maria. Unfortunately, we have already run over the time that you had allocated for this uh, seminar. It's 
uh, webinar. It's a very interesting discussion uh, that will definitely be continuing on uh, online, offline as, as we can and hope to, to welcome you back to Shanghai and to, to Beijing sometime, Maria. Um, if I could ask all the speakers to give their final hopes and cautions for our members online, uh, who are companies, what would you uh, just give uh, two sentences to, to uh, close your, uh, your remarks? Jörg, I start with you because I know that you have to run. She didn't want to say because you're the president. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the presidential verdict at the end of the dis uh, discussion. Again, I think we have to be realistic about uh, what China commits to, and then uh, it's the task of the European Chamber to do what we have been doing for 20 years, analyzing the Delta, uh, uh, trying to approach the Chinese government in order to rectify this, and also keeping basically uh, a very close uh, contact uh, with Brussels as uh, they uh, possibly are in a better position to enforce a couple of things. No, we are used to live with Delta, we are used to live with disappointment, but the biggest risk would not be engaging with the largest, fastest growing market in the world. Now that's enough of presidential voting. All right, thank you. Francois, Alicia, and then the final words to Maria, please. I think that uh, we should stick to something that Maria said, which is that uh, the EU should uh, not give up and should indeed insist on the other tools it has, defensive tools. I'm taking for granted that the agreement will actually be signed and even ratified, although we don't know that. I'm not a political expert on, on the EU parliament. But assuming that this happens, even over two years, it'll be hugely important uh, to maintain the other uh, defenses first. And second, not to fall hostage to a Chinese interpretation of the agreement, which would be conditional. Uh, on uh, other acts or other declarations not being contrarian to China. It's clear that we are going to have a very difficult period with China politically. I think everybody can see that. And it's not something that we created. It's something that goes out of the prison Chinese system. So how to maintain uh, enforcement of the agreement, how to maintain implementation, uh, and I don't even speak about the areas where it's not compuls not fully compulsory. Uh, that, I think, will be a huge challenge. Uh, and I I'm waiting with very great interest to see how uh, we manage that. Alicia? Alicia, would you have a few final words for our members? My, my words are very similar to Francois. I, I... However, I want to thank Maria because she has taken the time, the effort to, to really explain this very complex deal in very clear words here and elsewhere. And I think that's welcome because people need to understand um, what are the benefits. I see the benefits. I'm not saying I don't see them. But because of my history, perhaps this is the same uh, for Francois, I... I, I just don't think it will be wise, and this is the last thing I want to say, to oversell this deal because it's, it can really backfire even after ratification. I think that's a very, very important thing to realize. And I think Maria has been doing this, so no, no, no issues. But I think more generally, um, even for European companies, you know, feeling very protected and then finally not... <laughs> eventually not being protected. And this is, might not be the European Commission's fault, but the outcome, and the outcome we were talking about, that in itself is a risk because you may have been engaged in additional investments, yeah? So, so I think we need to treat all of this with lots of caution. Thank you. Maria, the final words are yours. Uh, the, I think... Oh, there will never be final words. And, and again, I, I do agree with a number of, of things that were said now by Alicia and Francois. I will just end probably by saying that I really think uh, it is extremely important for the European Union to have a strong policy vis-a-vis -vis China. 
it is one of our main economic partners and one of our main challenges as for many other people. So the right combination of engagement, Kai being part of it and autonomous measures, the right engagement of cooperation with other countries and also fighting for our own interest is, is what we should be aiming uh, for. And I am convinced that uh, that is what the European Union will try to deliver. And again, I think Kai is part of all that picture. Thank you very much, Maria. Carlo here with me in Shanghai, Francois, Alicia and, and Jörg in, in Beijing. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time to discuss with us and our members today. I think we had kind of record numbers of participants in Absolutely. this webinar this afternoon. It's a topic that's of interest to obviously to all our members and, and other stakeholders here in, in China. And we look forward to, forward to continuing the discussion. There are many more questions that we fortunately couldn't, uh, couldn't ask anymore as we're running out of time, but we hope that we will be able to clarify them in, in um, upcoming events. I wish everyone a happy Chinese New Year. Exactly, and, happy uh, Chinese New Year. <laughs> all the best to uh, Europe and uh, Alice, I think, in Taiwan. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.